set the stage here, um, we have uh, Jack Schmidt, who landed on the moon in December 1972, and Gene Krantz, who was the flight director for the mission. Now, that was a long time ago. And, you know, it's been a long time since the United States or any person has been on the moon. And in fact, it's been a long time since the United States has launched from humans from the United States from 2011 until last May of 2020, when uh, Doug Hurley and Bob Behnken launched, launched off of pad 39A, an old space shuttle pad at Kennedy Space Center. So now we're starting to see an increase in human spaceflight again. Um, our country plans on putting astronauts back on the moon in 2024, including the first American woman. So my first question is, uh, we'll start with, uh, we'll start with you, Jack. Uh, my first question is, how does the effort from the Apollo program compare with the effort that we are um, attempting today, putting astronauts back on the moon in 2024? Well, the effort's going to have to be pretty much the same. Uh, Apollo pretty well uh, set the, uh, the bar for how you get to the moon safely and uh, how you return safely. Uh, that uh, was uh, an important bar to have been set and Artemis is going to have to pretty much do many of the same things that uh, Apollo did. Now, there's a big difference today. We have some commercial partners that we did not have in those days who were are doing many of the same things. We had commercial partners because the uh, Apollo program was a system of contractors. There were for over 400,000 Americans involved, most of them in, con in the uh, contractor force. Uh, NASA had only about 50,000 of that number, uh, where so you can see that most of it was done through contractors. The, the contracting though today is very different. Uh, for Artemis, but the challenges of working in deep space and the risk of working in deep space haven't changed. And so they, uh, they really, uh, Apollo has, uh, I think, given them many, many of the lessons necessary for Artemis to succeed. Yeah, and so you did it, Jack, and so we know that it can be done. And uh, Gene, would you like to add anything to that? You know, what, how do you think that today's um, attempt to go back to the moon compares to what we did in the Apollo program? Well, I, th I think that the, uh... The environment is uh, significantly different. We had uh, John F. Kennedy, who made the lunar speech at Congress, and he made it at Rice University. And this, to a great extent, uh, inspired a nation. He defined a very clear goal. He established a time frame for its accomplishment. And to a great extent, he said why we should go ahead with this uh, grand venture. And the beauty was is that we had a generation of young people who were ready to step in to the ranks of not only mission control, but all over the United States in the workforce. Because right after Sputnik, they had established a student defense loan program that provided money for young people to go through college. And I had many of these young people who were arriving just at the beginning of the Gemini program. I had people who had grown up and and grown up in Indian reservations. I mean, the state of Oklahoma is incredible in the number of people. They provided several flight directors, controllers. So basically we had a unified nation moving forward with the grand messenger. And I think that's what we need today. We need this messenger to sell the program. Yeah, you know, I'm really glad you brought that up because if I remember correctly, um, the act that you were talking that you were talking about was passed by Congress called the National Defense Education Act of 1958. They ca came out post Sputnik, and they did um, offer. Well, I think one of the needs was to get uh, some of these engineers teaching in high school to help inspire the young people to choose engineering and science and math degrees. And I think that was uh, pretty successful. I think that, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we get to the end of our conversation here, but um, I'm glad that you mentioned that. And, you know, one other thing that I would, uh, this question is for Gene, is you think back to Apollo 17, or, or frankly any, I know you were flight director for many missions in the Apollo program. Do you have any stories uh, or maybe one particular story that you'd like to uh, pass on, you know, that maybe would be inspirational or, you know, help us start thinking about the future? The, uh, the real challenge of Apollo 17 
was uh, managing, leading the team that basically would be flying the last mission in that program because there was a lot of what I'd say concern relative to where do we go after the moon? And the unfortunate thing was people felt that the moon, the lunar program was the end, but basically I found the Skylab program which followed an incredible program to learn to keep man in space for up to 30, 60, 90 days at a time, learn about the sciences, move in with a generation of pioneering scientists in the studying astronomy, earth sciences, so basically, it was a question of challenging the team that I had to accept the fact that the future was exciting, it had change, it had opportunities, get ready. Yeah, I actually wrote a paper on the Skylab program when I was uh, working on my master's degree. So I found that to be very inspirational also. Um, so I'd like to go back to you, Jack, if you could think back to Apollo 17 also, if there's you know, maybe a story or something maybe that surprised you while you were walking on the surface of the moon that, you know, you got there and you were all ready with your mission. And as a geologist, I know you had um, you had a, a plan out there and, you know, maybe you were hoping to make some discoveries while you were on the moon. But could you, you know, maybe share a story or a surprise from the mission with us? I mean, I'd like to build uh, on something Gene has said. Uh, and that uh, the environment has indeed changed from Apollo uh, in the Apollo era. Uh, but one aspect of it really, I don't think has changed. And that is the international uh, context in which Artemis and other future American space programs uh, will uh, move forward. Uh, the challenges uh, that face the only great uh, defender of individual freedom on this planet are still there. And uh, we can't ignore that. And to ignore it in space would be at our peril. Now, with respect to Apollo 17, I think one of the main lessons that I, I feel very important, and I obviously felt it was important for a long time, is that uh, we put a field geologist in astronaut clothes with astronaut training on the moon to use the experience of field geology that that geologist had, namely yours truly, uh, in order to uh, advance the exploration of that small planet. And that uh, advancement has not stopped. Uh, a, a scientist, a field geologist like myself, continues to work on the information from Apollo today. And I think it's very, very important that every uh, mission now to the moon, uh, Artemis or otherwise, uh, include field geology experience. It, uh, it's, it's going to be additive, in spite of the fact that I was able to uh, convince Sal Shepard and Dick Slayton that we should have a simulation-based field geology training program uh, for all the astronauts. And nevertheless, you cannot duplicate experience. You can't duplicate it for test pilots, as you well know, and you can't duplicate it for explorers. Uh, you train as best you can, but that experience and in intuition, and as uh, Gene Shoemaker used to say, perspicacity, that comes with experience is extremely important. Uh, so I, I think that's one of the lessons, one of the major lessons that comes from Apollo 17. Another major lesson is that even though, as Gene has indicated, it was the last of the Apollo series and many of the people who made Apollo successful would now go on to other things. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they came together as a team to make Apollo 17 from a technical point of view I think the most successful of all the Apollo missions. That's extraordinary. Uh, and we had no significant failures. Sure, uh, the commander broke a fender off the lunar rover and the uh, flight controllers solved that problem for us very quickly overnight. But uh, that's, that was a minor issue compared to some of the problems that were faced by earlier missions and from which Apollo 17 clearly uh, benefited. Yeah, I, I remember how disappointed I was when the Apollo program was canceled because I was being very interested in what was going on. I was an um, uh, aspiring astronaut myself back in those days, and it was disappointing to see the program canceled because I, I mean, there was so much more left to explore. So, uh, Jack, to pick up on one of the things you said, so, you, you know, young people often ask me, you know, what do I need to do to become an astronaut? And I tell them, as you look to the future, the skills I would look for if I was hiring astronauts would be a combination of engineering and geology. 
because of the missions that we plan on uh, flying. So could you tell us, you know, think back to when you chose your major, what was it that inspired you to choose uh, your college major, geology? Well, my college major really was influenced by my experience with my father, who was a exploration geologist in the mining industry. And I grew up being his field assistant, his guru, if you will, uh, carrying uh, samples and, and the like, and actually as a surveyor. So when I, when I uh, enrolled at Caltech, I was not thinking geology, as a matter of fact. I was thinking physics. I felt like uh, I would become the world's greatest physicist by going to Caltech. And I soon realized within the first week or two that the world's greatest physicists were sitting on either side of me and that I was going to uh, uh, really drop back to something I loved anyway. Geology, field geology in particular, gets you outdoors. It's science, it's basic science applied uh, to earth problems. It's really a very exciting field. And at the same time, I was learning engineering, a beginning of engineering, the basics of physics and math, math being extremely important. Uh, that uh, later on benefited me as I, in, in the legal sense, read engineering with my colleagues uh, at NASA, uh, people like Gene Kranz and others who uh, over several years prior to Apollo 17 really taught me the basic fundamental uh, issues and concepts of engineering. Uh, so your, your geology and engineering are certainly two fields, but I would also add that anybody aspiring to work in space, whether on Earth or in space itself, should get as broad an education as possible. Become a specialist, know how to be a specialist in some field, but get as broad an education as you possibly can. Mathematics being a fundamental part of everything that we do, uh, that's important, but also the humanities. I think understanding the context, the historical context in which a space is being uh, uh, explored is extremely important as well. And uh, so uh, broad education, great physical training, uh, to keep physically active all the time. And I, of course, still argue that all astronauts should become jet pilots. I found that an extremely valuable experience uh, for my uh, activities as an astronaut. Yeah, I, I think, Jack, I think all of that is actually great advice. And I just have to throw in here, uh, two weeks ago, I, I was in Zion National Park up in Utah. What an absolutely beautiful place. Um, but I was, I was a math major, but I got to tell you, I also started out as a physics major and switched over to math. But more on that later. Um, I wanted to uh, go back to Jean and ask you the same question. So you are, or you were an aerospace engineer, and I wondered if you, in college, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, why you chose that degree for yourself, and then maybe, you know, a little more on maybe some advice for young people that want to work in the space program someday, as far as choosing a degree. Well, actually, I started off in an entirely different direction. I grew up in a military boarding house during uh, World War II, and I was surrounded by naval aviators from the Great Lakes Naval Air Training Center. I was working at uh, many jobs there because I had to help support my mother. And I had two high school teachers who apparently thought that I had some talent that was basically not being used yet. And they coached me for the uh, entrance examination for the uh, Naval Academy. And I passed the examination, got the appointment, but unfortunately the diet I'd been uh, following working uh, didn't uh, basically, uh, provide the entrance capabilities that I needed. I was, I was diabetic at that time. And uh, basically I found a, uh, a scholarship for uh, deceased veterans of World War I, provided uh, 500 bucks, believe it or not, you could get into college for $500 at that time. And I went to a small aviation college, Parks College in East St. Louis, Illinois, mainly because I was uh, going to fly. That was my entire dream. And I went through parks and the ROTC instructor said, hey, don't quit now because I was going to go into the cadet program. But he said, no, finish your degree. Get your education. And I did. Went into the Air Force. I actually flew the first three mass-produced jets, the F-80, 86, and F-100. And uh, when I came back from Korea, I became a flight test engineer in the B-52. This was the first time that I really used any of my engineering education. And from then on, basically the story was, 
at the completion of a very successful test program, basically I applied to NASA. They're looking for qualified engineers and from then on, it was a ball. I had a blast every minute of my life working in the arena of space. So, you know, I when young people ask me about engineering, I always I talk about problem solving and how, um, in, in fact, just a, a quick story. I was recently talking to a woman who hires at a bank and she said to me, I'll hire an engineer in a minute. And I said, well, why would you hire an engineer to work at a bank? And she said, they know how to solve problems. So, you know, I mean, you you can really do pretty much anything with an engineering degree. And I, I wanted to say, I wanted to ask both of you about problem solving and, you know, maybe your opinion or maybe uh, something from Apollo 17 that you could uh, tell us about um, a problem that you solved. But I wanna say, first of all, I taught at the Air Force Academy uh, quite a while ago. I taught in the math department. And when we presented theorems or improved theorems in the class, you know, sometimes you lose the student. And one of the requirements at the Air Force Academy math department was you had to have examples in the classroom so the students wouldn't say, why am I learning this? I'm never going to use it. So things like, what is the first derivative for? If you have a function, the first derivative gives you velocity. The second derivative gives you acceleration. Or if you have a function, if you integrate it, the area under the curve is the probability that that event will happen at a point in time. So there's lots of examples for calculus and there's lots of examples for math. And if you design the whole thing around problem solving, it makes it come alive for the students. So I like to emphasize problem solving. And, you know, we don't want to run away from our problems in life. We always want to face them. So uh, let's start with you, Jean. Um, could you give us, I know you have lots of examples, but could you maybe pick one of them out and share with us there were, uh, that, there were uh, many problems that we face throughout all the programs, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and the Skylab. But I think the majority of our learning to solve problems came through our process of training. Our instructors basically observed every person that was preparing for mission. They sat through the flight planning sessions, the mission rule sessions, how we debated the trade-offs we made in establishing mission rules in relationship to the to the flight crew we had and include in the program. So it was it was really a constant series of risk versus gain trades. How far are you going to go with the problem to basically achieve the goals in your mission? And if you can't do that, how do you down mode? And I think that the uh, one of the key examples that that always sticks in my mind, it's completely been overlooked was Apollo 14 when basically on the final, the first pass in front of the moon getting ready to descend, uh, Dick Thorson, one of my controllers, saw the abort indication there. And he said, my God, if this we have an abort, the engine's enabled, basically this mission's over. And in a two hour period of time, Thorson working with his back room and Draper Labs came up with a patch, okay, that was executed on the next rev, the final opportunity to go down to the moon, in fact, <laughs> Alan Shepard was backing out of the patch to re-enable some of the abort functions during descent. And it was really the ability of this team to recognize a problem, work individually and collectively to solve a problem, and their management having the confidence to let us execute the solution we had. So it's really recognition, detection, action, and then having the confidence to move on and say, this is the direction I gotta go. Yeah, I can imagine that was a pretty hairy situation. And, and you know, uh, Jack, uh, over to you, you know, obviously scientists have a whole method for problem solving. Um, so I wonder if you can make a comment, maybe an example, like you mentioned something happened to the lunar rover on Apollo 17. Um, I'm sure that you had a lot of uh, things, surprises happen to you on uh, your mission or, you know, throughout your career. Could you share with us an experience or your opinion on uh, so problem solving? Most of my scientific uh, surprises on Apollo 17 uh, required fairly instantaneous 
problem solving, if you will. I mean, but a field geologist is used to that. You look at what is presented to you, uh, mentally come up with uh, what we call multiple working hypotheses to explain what you see and then test those hypotheses in real time uh, and go forward. One of the best examples is the discovery of the uh, volcanic, the orange volcanic ash at uh, station four, Shorty Crater, uh, where we only had a half an hour left in our uh, walk back uh, constraints uh, back to the, in case the rover failed, we had to have the ability to walk back to the uh, lunar module. Uh, and we had 30 minutes and in 30 minutes, uh, we were able, I was able to put together a plan for sampling and uh, that uh, really, except for, with one exception that I regret, uh, we got everything we needed to know to understand that particular location. It was basically a bedrock sample of lunar volcanic ash that had erupted three and a half billion years ago uh, on the moon. And it's, it's turned out to be an extremely important uh, set of samples for understanding not only the history of the moon, but also what the composition of the deep interior uh, probably is in some respects. But I had also mentioned uh, in a much simpler way to anything related to anything like uh, what faced Apollo 14, uh, and that is the uh, the broken fender. And it, it was significant because with a broken fender, you're going to get dust raining down on you uh, throughout all of the lunar EVAs. And that's not a good thing to do. Uh, there are a lot of uh, implications of, of dust, thermal and otherwise. And so uh, it was a good idea to fix that fender. Uh, the uh, I had ultimate confidence, having worked many of these kind of problems in mission control with uh, Gene's uh, crew, uh, that uh, by the time we got up the next morning, uh, they, there would be a solution. Uh, I'm not sure the commander was quite so confident. I'm not sure he got a lot of sleep uh, that night, uh, have, having broken the fender in the first place, and then not being as confident in, in how mission control operated. And sure enough, the next morning we got up and, and, and uh, with under the leadership of John Young, but with uh, the uh, inspiration and innovation of Terry Neal, uh, they had a, uh, a fix for us uh, and basically relied on, you guessed it, gray duct tape to put together a, uh, a replacement fender using the photo maps uh, that we had in, uh, in the cabin at the time. Uh, so uh, that's that I think illustrates in a much simpler way what Gene was saying is that the, the, the team approach, the simulations, the mission sims and other simulations that everybody went through in mission control uh, gave me, at least as a crewman, the confidence that whatever problem arose, uh, they would uh, they would get it fixed. And the ultimate, of course, in seeing that happen uh, sequentially was Apollo 13. You know, I, I love hearing these stories because a person can really, I mean, things break around my house all the time. And, you know, you're challenged, you know, you try to fix it yourself and you end up calling somebody to come in and fix it for you. But, um, you know, I think about these stories from the Apollo program and from the space program, and they really are, they're just inspirational. Because um, you, you never really know what's going to happen. I mean, you can try to guess how things are going to break. You put the procedures together, and then you actually go fly the mission, and something that maybe you never even thought of will happen. Um, I so I'd like to. I think that generally was the case. Uh, Gene may, may correct me, but uh, I think most of the problems that arose on each of the Apollo missions other than maybe Apollo 17 were problems that we had not fully anticipated, but the discipline of training and simulations meant that they were solved in very short order. And one of the things that impressed me as a, a 30 year old when I went into the program was how rapidly these uh, teams of, of young engineers younger than I came together to solve a problem. They would diagnose the problem, they would have uh, alternative solutions ready to present to management, if not within an hour or two, within the, the, uh, uh, the nighttime, and, uh, and the problem would get solved. It was just very impressive me. It was a synergism of these little teams, and no matter, it, all the right people seem to show up at the right place in order to solve these problems. I, 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 Gene deserves an awful lot of credit for putting that whole system together. Uh, but it, uh, it also is credit to the young engineers of being willing to work together, not worry about who got credit uh, for the solution and to actually solve a problem. Yeah, and I'll tell you, the few, for those 
uh, crew members and flight controllers that are going to be um, working in the Artemis program, there's so much that they can learn from what happened in the Apollo program. So I want to go back to, you know, something that, uh, Jack, you started talking about earlier, and that's the Artemis program. And I wondered if you, and I'm going to ask both of you this question, if you can talk a little bit about, you know, why we're going back to the moon. You know, why is it important for our country to, ex to expend the resources, which is, you know, quite a bit, to send astronauts back to the moon? You know, why are we doing that? And, you know, wh why is it necessary? So if you could just maybe just give us a little bit of your philosophy on, on the future. And we'll begin with Jack. The most important uh, reason to return to deep space and to, and to basically sustain ourselves there indefinitely, uh, I think is, uh, is what generally referred to as a geopolitical reason, but it really comes down to the, uh, the America, the United States being the principal defender of individual freedom on this planet. And we have to be involved in this new ocean that we call space. Uh, otherwise, uh, international competition by people who are less interested in individual freedom than we are, uh, will uh, will dominate. Uh, we just can't ha let that happen. So that probably is the most fundamental reason for it. It was the reason for that basically underpinned Apollo, and it is a reason that I think underpins Artemis. Uh, the uh, there is another reason, however, and that it goes back pretty much into my field, and that is uh, the resources that are available on the moon. Not only are the resources there that can sustain us and human beings in general in space over uh, in an indefinite period of time. But one of those resources may well sustain us here on Earth, and that's a, a fusion fuel called uh, helium-3, a light isotope of helium, uh, that uh, ultimately may, uh, may be extremely important to us to have clean energy here on Earth, and, and, and energy that can support an, uh, an increasing population. So uh, with those two reasons, I, I, and there are many other scientific reasons, I mean, we're gonna learn a, a lot of science by going back to the moon. We've only explored a very small part of that uh, small planet. Uh, but uh, when you come right down to it, I think the, the importance of the United States being uh, permanently in space and the importance of uh, the resources of the moon, not only for use there, but on earth and then to supply the resources necessary actually to get to Mars and initially to sustain yourself there. Okay, I, great, thank you. And Jean, uh, over to you. Uh, why do you think it's important for our country to lead and to go back to the moon? Going back to the moon and living there for an extended period of time is going to develop technologies that we can only dream of now. And these are technologies that will basically fuel the economic engine of our country. I believe that the uh, Jack talked about the uh, political aspects. I believe the economic aspects are the only ones that are truly going to resonate with the people of our nation. Right now in the COVID-19, we are basically exercising survival on an entirely different platform that we'd ever experienced before. And I think as we go forward in the years, as we press forward in the years, we're gonna be faced with other complex problems of many different natures that we hadn't foreseen. And I believe that living in an alien environment for an extended period of time is going to develop technologies that may address the global warming issue that we've got. It may address the challenge to industry in our nation to reach out and really visualize answers to problems the instant they come up, to grasp a hold of it, challenge it, and then go forward with it. So it's really a combination of several things. In summary, I believe it's economic, and I think that is going to be the driver that will resonate with our population because we have to capture the people of our nation if we're going to move forward in this kind of a mission. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's really a great point. And people, uh, you know, when I talk about the International Space Station, for example, it is completely solar powered. Um, we have technology on the space station which removes the carbon dioxide from the air and, and we're, we're actually targeting eventually being able to 100% uh, recycle the air and 100% recycle the water. We're not there yet, but these are technologies that are being work, worked on um, that will help life here on Earth. Um, so I want to switch gears here a little bit and, and maybe start moving uh, towards talking about Aerospace Alley. 
uh, which is why we're here tonight. Um, so to set the stage, um, I'm currently serving as an advisor to the National Space Council. And uh, Jack, I know you're also an advisor to the National Space Council. And Jean, I know you're a, a consultant. And what I wanted to do is talk about uh, maybe some, uh, some of the workforce issues our country is facing. So on my committee, which is education and outreach, we have called the state of our country's education system right now a national security issue. Are we preparing the future workforce? And in our case, the future workforce in the space industry. So, you know, we've all heard the concerns. Uh, there's not enough high school science teachers. There's not enough high school math teachers. Um, there's not enough aerospace workers right now in things like uh, welding, electrician, uh, machinists, pilots, and even careers like air traffic control. So we're trying to reach out uh, to young people to get them interested in, um, in maybe uh, just at least informed and give them the uh, ability to get these skills. Not every young person needs to attend a four-year college. You know, maybe they can go to a trade school. Maybe they can go to a community college. So we need to introduce these ideas to our youth. So uh, let's uh, start with you, Jean. And I want to uh, ask, you know, why is it so important that we prepare our youth, our young people, for these uh, roles today? I mean, could we just take adults who are currently working and move them to these industries? Or, you know, why do we need to reach out and prepare our youth for these careers? Any comments? That, uh, we've got six kids and basically five girls, and I've watched them progress through their careers. And they have the passion, the energy, and the imagination to step forward and make and address challenges. They might be educational challenges, might be what is the career path that they're going to take? How are they doing when they get out of college? And I think that uh, young people have the ability to address these types of issues much easier than what I'd say the more established older types, those that might be in the 30s. So I think youth people, you, young people, have the ability to step forward and buy into an arena of risk and be very successful. I think the key thing we have to do, however, is get to the teachers because the teachers provide the inspiration for the youth. The parents just are busy working right now, so it's really the teachers and the educational materials. I think that the, the documents, documentation they have in history is almost completely devoid of space and what we've done in space and how we did it, and why we did it, and what were the challenges. So I think that there's, you have to get into the teaching component, you have to get into the texts that they're using for the teaching. Okay, great. And, you know, it's great to hear that your six children listen to you, Jean, because sometimes, you know, my two children, they didn't always listen to me. So you're right about <laughs> having the teachers, uh, you know, involved in encouraging. Um, Jack, any comment from you on the, on the uh, future workforce and things that we can do today with young people um, to encourage them to uh, look into these careers that are necessary for the future space workforce? Well, I, I would say that uh, in, in spite of any difficulties the two of you have had with uh, getting your children to listen to you, the, the parents are, have to be emphasized as well. Parents have to, under, have to be encouraging to their children's uh, future career, and I know the two of you have done that. Uh, but uh, in addition, I think uh, education, the broad public education, needs to get back to the uh, to fundamentals of teaching. Uh, Gene alluded to that uh, in one respect, but uh, but overall, uh, there's so many other things that have worked their way into the curriculum of public education, and clearly there are exceptions to what I'm going to say, but basically the broad area of public education uh, has some significant deficiencies today, particularly in the teaching of history, uh, the teaching of mathematics, uh, the the and and and. I would say maybe most importantly, uh, exposing young people to critical thinking, to taking uh, an issue and looking at all the factors that you can that bear on that issue and coming, uh, coming up to some understanding of one of what the issue is and what uh, various alternative solutions might be uh, to that particular issue. Earlier, we discussed 
the uh, question of problem solving. And, uh, uh, and one reason why I think you find engineers in demand, uh, and, and even in the legal profession, is because they understand, they, take a, they see a problem and they want to solve it. Unfortunately, a great deal of education now is just to treat the symptoms of problems rather than solving them. Uh, and that, uh, that is part of critical thinking. Uh, so the public education system is extremely important. The charter schools, homeschooling also are very important, partly because they offer an alternative to the situation we find ourselves in today. And that is the absence of, of extensive teaching in history, in mathematics, and in critical thinking. Yeah, that, that's really a great point. And you know, I have found um, having problem solving skills decreases the amount of stress a person has in their life. And, and I just think that's just good, good for your health overall. So, you know, thanks for your comments. I know we have uh, teachers listening here also. So um, uh, uh, what I wanna do is uh, take what you said, Jack, and you know, maybe uh, take it one step further and connect it to Aerospace Alley, which is the reason that we're here tonight. So, you know, we're working with Wings Over the Rockies and uh, we know that Colorado and the Mountain West are coming together in Aerospace Alley. And I commend uh, us and them for doing that. Um, and the collaboration expands, you know, all areas of aerospace, including uh, education, industry, uh, the community, as well as government. So, um, Jack, could you say um, a few things about Aerospace Alley? And, you know, why do you think that this, you know, you're participating here today, so thank you for supporting that. And what do you think is the best way for uh, Aerospace Alley to achieve uh, these goals of expanding uh, air and space uh, education in, in Colorado? Well, I appreciate very much being uh, asked to uh, assist in the uh, launch as well as in the activities of Aerospace Alley. It is an extremely important uh, Mountain West initiative. Uh, it is one of those things that, uh, of course, being located in, in one of the major national hubs of aerospace activity uh, in the Denver uh, area, as well as uh, that stretches into Colorado Springs that you're so familiar with, uh, the Air Force Academy, the uh, Space Force and inaugural uh, uh, headquarters is there. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if it uh, remains there over time. Uh, and then uh, you have uh, major corporations, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, all of which uh, have supported uh, the wings uh, over the Rockies effort to create Aerospace Alley. Uh, and, and the individuals that are involved, uh, John Barry, uh, Major General John Barry, uh, Clay Lacey, all of whom have uh, stepped up uh, to support wings as well as Aerospace Alley. Uh, it just shows a commitment in the community uh, to the educational themes, to the uh, engineering themes, uh, and to the experiences that uh, Aerospace Alley will provide young people throughout the, the uh, Mountain West. It's a, an initiative that is, uh, is extremely important to take on, and one which uh, we can always say we wish had happened earlier, but now let's go for it. Great, thank you. Well, thank you for uh, taking part in this. And um, also, Gene, I wanted to ask you, you know, how did you become involved with Wings Over the Rockies and Aerospace Alley? And, and why is that important to you to be part of this effort? I think the uh, Aerospace Alley is an extremely important element. And I think they've got a good model they were flying. They, uh, I was there about uh, two, three years ago when basically the EAA basically was having the uh, Eagles program that they're having. We were flying a teacher from the Denver area along with uh, basically a student in the same school. And they're attempting to cover a good portion of the schools that existed in the Denver area. I think the key thing that is necessary for the young people addressing space is how do we provide them the hands-on experience? It's one thing to hear it in class, study it in books, but somehow or other they have to get the touch, the feel, they have to experience what they are planning to start doing for the rest of their life. I look at the co-op program. Is there such a thing we use very successful out at NASA? We are hiring 
based on the co-ops that young people that came in from college. Is Aerospace Alley, does it have a co-op affiliate there where you could provide this kind of an experience, say, yeah, this is what I want to do, or no, I don't quite like that, or I ought to go there. So I think that the Aerospace Alley is going to provide or can provide this hands-on experience that young people need in order to select the direction for the rest of their life and, pri and provide the fuel to keep the aerospace industry going in later years. Young people are fuel for the workforce. Yeah, I think those are great comments from both of you. And, you know, speaking for myself, it was, you know, many years ago that I got involved with Wings Over the Rockies and the teacher in flight program I thought was just absolutely incredible you know for a teacher to be able to go out and have that experience and then bring that back into the classroom i mean it just makes it so much more real for the students and programs like that i just uh, tremendously support and i'm still involved i, I think it might have been 2006 it's been over 10 years since um i've been supporting the mission um i love the museum uh uh, and I love the uh, uh, new facility, the Exploration of Flight uh, Campus at Centennial Airport. And I think all of those uh, places and missions are very inspirational for the children um, and even for older students. Uh, so we're coming to a close here and I wanted to give each of you a chance. Um, I think we'll start with you, Jean, um, to make a closing statement if there's anything that you wanna say, maybe a question that I didn't ask today or maybe a topic that you think is really important that you'd like to make a closing statement on. So Gene, we'll start with you. I think that the uh, challenge our nation faces is building a educated workforce to address problems that we have yet to visualize. Issues that basically are beyond the realm of imagination. So it's really a question you talked about earlier when we started off about problem solving. Somewhere along the line, it would almost be a, a great idea. I talked to a, a Johnson Space Center, the uh, center director, that somewhere along the line, it would be great if we could establish a boot camp for young project managers where they can take something, run with it for a while. If they make mistakes, learn from them. For some reason, it seems that Learning to a great extent comes from seeing something you did wrong and then basically recognizing that and then moving forward and using that as part of the learning experience for growth. So somewhere we have to provide young people, the workforce of the future, the opportunity to grow without fear that if they make a mistake, they're out of a job or they're gonna have to make some changes. Mistakes are part of life and we have to learn to live with them and move forward and grow with them. Yeah, I think that I think that's really a, um, a great concept. I look back, I've got the uh, Chandra uh, X-ray Observatory poster behind me. I flew that mission, took the Chandra Observatory up in 1999, built for five years. But it's, it's been operating now over 20. And we learned from the mistakes of the Hubble program and you know Hubble, as you all know, um, had initial problems, but it was fixed by the astronauts. And you know, all, I think there were something like four or five repair flights, and we learned from that. And so one of the things I try to uh, talk about is iterating. You know, you do something the first time, you make mistakes, you iterate on it, you try it over, and you keep doing this over and over again. And you know, that's one of the techniques of problem solving. Um, is you know, don't be afraid to make that first mistake and then you continue to improve on it. Um, so I wanna go over to Jack. Uh, is there a closing statement that you would like to make? Uh, anything that we maybe haven't mentioned or something important that you'd like to share with our audience, our supporters? I might, uh, Eileen, I might build, uh, build on uh, two or three things that uh, Jean has said uh, about hands-on experience and what Aerospace Alley can do to uh, provide that in many different ways. Uh, my own uh, flight experience began when I was uh, 29 years old. Uh, that's pretty late. But from that experience of actually, uh, let's call it hands-on experience with flying uh, jet aircraft and helicopters, uh, I developed a confidence in myself and in the machines I was flying that was extremely important uh, feedback into the overall astronaut experience. And, and 
putting young people and teachers and others into a situation where they can develop that kind of confidence in themselves, as well as in what they, the machines that they're flying, uh, and understand that if you make a mistake, you get yourself out of that mistake. Deke Slayton made an extremely important point of that many, many different times, is that the T-38 that we flew and the helicopters that we flew uh, were dynamic simulators. Uh, and that if something happened uh, psychologically, you had to get, you had to deal with it. Uh, whereas our other simulators, you just press a button and start over again. Uh, the, uh, the aircraft, you can't do that. And that is a tremendous confidence builder. It, uh, as you say, it, you learn that if you make a mistake, you have to figure out a way to get out of it. Uh, and Aerospace Alley, I think, is going to provide those kinds of experiences in many different ways, not just in flight, but also in the kind of programs that Gene has talked about. Uh, I, uh, I strongly encourage everyone to become supporters and active supporters in the new initiative that is uh, now called Aerospace Alley in the uh, Denver area. Yeah, and I think, you know, all three of us uh, by being here today are, you know, I, I think our presence really speaks for itself. Uh, we really believe in this mission of Aerospace Alley and we, uh, we know not only do we believe in the mission, but it's a necessary mission for our country. And, and as I had said earlier, it's even a national security issue, preparing the workforce of the future and having the right skills necessary to do these types of missions that will keep the United States a leader in space. And you know, I believe the future is in space. You know, you know if you think back um, you know, 150 years ago, who knew that the airplane would be doing the things it's doing today. And as you project 150 years into the future, you know, what will the world be like? And I think that, you know, I, I, as we mentioned earlier, it's a very important that the United States be a leader. Um, if, if you take a look at, uh, well, I don't want to get too philosophical here, but, you know, I believe with the United States being a leader, you know, we bring uh, peace into outer space and we also bring the international community into outer space and we bring the lessons that we learn from outer space back to earth to make this a better place to live. So all of these are uh, very important things and I believe Aerospace Alley is a, you know, just a great supporter of these missions. Um, and in closing, I want to thank all of our listeners who are here today, um, the individual sponsors and the corporate sponsors that support this effort of Aerospace Alley. Um, and also our great Wings Over the Rockies uh, Air and Space Museum, which I absolutely love, um, the new campus of exploration of flight at Centennial Airport, and all of the inspirational programs uh, that are being developed that we need and love. Um, you're a critical part of keeping America first in air and space. So thank you very much, and I hope you all have a great evening. <laughs>